This is a tutorial on how to annotate PDFs in Adobe Acrobat, geared primarily for scholars in the humanities. First you'll want to download Acrobat if you have not done so already. Most of the features I'll be covering in this video are available in the free version of Acrobat Reader Document Cloud, which can be downloaded from the Acrobat website. Uncheck the optional offers, and then click Install. Once the installation is finished, you'll be able to view any of your PDFs in the interface here. The chances of actually making use of our notes, as I've argued earlier, hinges heavily upon their imminent visibility. Being able to see which passages have been annotated within a text without having to cross-reference separate documents. Shifting to digital text not only enhances their searchability and modularity, it also allows us to layer annotation and citation within the text itself. In the top toolbar, you have the basic document and page navigation settings, as well as a couple of the more popular commenting functions. You can see more of these by clicking the menu in the side pane, which provides a list of all the comments in the document, as well as an extended commenting toolbar. This is pretty similar across most of the recent versions. Here you can see some of the differences between the Document Cloud Reader and Acrobat 11 Pro. Right-clicking the toolbars will give a more comprehensive list of functions in both versions, but Acrobat Pro does give you more ability to customize them, which can be nice when using narrow windows for side-by-side -side comparison, or when reading in portrait mode on a tablet. I like to customize it so that the most useful tools are directly accessible, which you can do by right-clicking on the icons themselves or using the Edit Toolset menu. Acrobat Pro also gives you the ability to create and manage bookmarks. You can still see pre-existing bookmarks in Acrobat Reader, but you won't be able to edit them. Bookmarks are a fundamental form of annotation because they mark the structure of a document far more effectively than a table of contents. The collection of William Faulkner novels that I have opened here doesn't have any yet, and so we're stuck scrolling through the PDF or entering inexact page numbers. The table of contents is obviously a good page to bookmark, which I'll do by clicking the icon or by using Control b Then I'll scroll down to the first novel in the collection, Absalom Absalom, and do the same. But since my display is zoomed in, the bookmarks I just made are zoomed to whatever section of the page I was on when I created them. To fix this, all I have to do is select the full screen view, right click the bookmark I'd like to adjust, and click Set Destination, which will make it so the bookmark opens as a full page. Depending on the length of the PDF, it may be easier to scroll through and bookmark as you go, or to work from the table of contents. I can see that the next bookmark is on page 117, but if I already have the table of contents selected, it will insert this bookmark out of order. It's easy enough to rearrange the bookmarks by dragging them, but if you do want it to show up in the right place, you must select the one immediately before it. It may also be helpful to know that any text selected while you're creating the bookmark will be copied into the bookmark itself. I don't really want all capitals in my titles, otherwise this would save me a bit of time here. I'll go ahead and quickly bookmark the rest of the PDF now, and then rearrange them by dragging them into the correct position. Bookmarks are essentially hierarchies of positions within a document that can be extended infinitely beyond the table of contents to include chapters, pages within chapters, or positions within pages. They also allow us to create more personalized hierarchies. Say if I were writing about the dialogue between the characters Quentin and Shreve. I could just do a keyword search for the name Shreve, and then create a separate hierarchy with all of the relevant passages. Or if I wanted to focus on Rosa Coldfield's narrative and rhetorical style for class, I could create another hierarchy for this purpose. Now that we've annotated the structure of the PDF, let's try marking up the text itself. There are a few ways to go about this. You can place a sticky note anywhere on the page and write a whole essay in it if you want. Even though we're more interested in personal annotation at the moment, it's worth noting that any comment text can be replied to by other users seeking to collaborate. You can highlight, underline, and cross out specific passages. You can type in the margins and draw on the page, which is perhaps most useful when marking up graphic content. You can customize the color of your annotations by selecting them and then using the paint bucket in the top toolbar. You can change their opacity if you want to make them more or less conspicuous. Right-clicking on any annotation will enable you to set its style as the default, 
which you can also do in the individual properties menu. All of these comments are listed in the side pane and can be selected and edited from there as well. I tend to rely most on the highlighter because it allows me to embed detailed notes within specific passages. Absalom Absalom begins from a little after two o'clock until almost sundown of the long, still, hot, weary, dead September afternoon. They sat in what Miss Coldfield still called the office because her father had called it that. Which leaves us rather uncertain about the time frame of the narrative, which is expressed in comparative terms laden with subjective anticipation. The 43 summers separating Miss Coldfield from her girlhood appear all the more precise by comparison. We're also made to wonder about this someone whose ideas about the relative heat of light and darkness carry a lasting authority over the house, and by extension, Miss Coldfield. Aspects of the house figuratively accent aspects of Rosa herself. The ancient flecks of paint fill the room with a certain dinginess and history. And the multiple blooms of the wisteria outside evoke the kind of blooming from girlhood into womanhood that Miss Coldfield has not experienced, sequestered within the house. There's also the sparrows, which, for me at least, recall the line from Hamlet about the special providence in the fall of a sparrow which conveys ideas about time and fate that seem appropriate in this context. I've always been particularly fond of the voice which would not cease, just vanish, for its paradoxical combination of sight and sound. How can something vanish without being visible in the first place? Are we to infer that the voice persists in some way, even though it has vanished? That it disappears without continuing to be present? I'll give this line another color for emphasis while noting the second mention of both the wisteria and the sparrows, to lend more credibility to the previous interpretations, as well as the interesting description of Miss Coldfield's flesh embattled in virginity, not for virginity, which suggests some violence inherent in virginity itself, different from merely fending off bold or undesirable advances. In my current annotated version of the novel, I've used a sticky note comment in order to compare this opening scene with one from later on, Sticky notes are helpful for more general observations and comparisons of this nature, especially for passages that span several pages rather than several lines. Scrolling through, you can see that I've generally opted for a two-tone color scheme that marks passages of interest in yellow and passages of greater interest in orange. I occasionally use a purple highlight as well to mark a certain structural or narrative node, like a change in place or a change in time or the various appearances and mentions of significant characters. Here I'm using the purple highlight to mark moments where Faulkner uses parentheses to distinguish the characters speaking from those being spoken to. As annotations accumulate, the sidebar becomes increasingly useful. I have over a thousand comments in this particular PDF, which makes it rather difficult to locate any one of them simply by scrolling through the pages or the chapters. Luckily, I have the option to sort all of them by author, date, type, checkmark status, and color. As you can see, sorting them by color is especially useful with my commenting scheme. The sidebar makes it easier to select and edit the properties of multiple comments at once. If I wanted to distinguish the notes I was using for a particular occasion, an essay or a class, say, I could easily assign them a new color entirely, but I could also just select them by clicking on the checkbox here. This would allow me to easily view the relevant sampling of annotations without having to alter the color scheme itself. You also have the option to expand and collapse all comments here, export them to a new document, and access some of the advanced controls for how they are displayed. While we've been focusing primarily on a work of fiction here, these techniques can easily be adapted for any variety of text. Here you can see a critical theoretical text, Allegories of Reading, by Paul de Man, annotated using more or less the same scheme. The main difference being that I have repurposed the purple highlights to mark structural transitions in the argument and reference to other text. So far, I found the three-tone color scheme adequate for my purposes, letting the third color act as a catch-all for comments that I want to distinguish from the first two. But you could easily expand this scheme by drawing on different colors and types of annotation. Hopefully you can now see how PDFs provide us with the means to write, organize, and personalize annotations far more efficiently than we would in a printed text.
how they enable us to write paragraphs worth of notes on a specific page or within a specific highlighted passage, so that our marginalia, previously restricted by the margins of the page, is no longer marginal. The most ephemeral traces of every reading can be inscribed in the moment and with the greatest possible detail within the text itself.